The wheel of time turns, and dolls come and pass, leaving characters that become legend. Legend fades to myth, and even the myth is long forgotten when the customizer that gave it birth comes again. In one age, called the Third Age by some, an age yet to come, an age long past, a wind rose in a doll maker's workshop. The wind was not the beginning. There are neither beginnings nor rendings to the turning of the wheel of time. But it was a beginning. If you haven't seen Amazon Prime's version of Wheel of Time, then stop this video right now and go watch it. I promise that it'll be worth it. Just pause the video right here and I'll see you in a few hours. Go ahead, I'll wait. Okay, have you watched it? Yes? Okay, good. Now you understand that Moraine Damodred is one of the most frustratingly badass literary characters ever created. You'll also understand why I felt the intense need to recreate this character in doll form. Her costumes are breathtaking, the props are so detailed, and, well, she's freaking awesome. Do I need to say more? However, I'm not planning on making her a carbon copy of Rosamund Pike, the actress that plays Marine, like I did with my corpse bride, Emily. The base doll I chose to make her out of couldn't possibly look identical to the actress, no matter how hard I tried. But you know me, I'll get her as close as I can. Ah, Rainbow High Dolls. I wasn't sure what to think of them at first. But as time went on, I knew I needed to customize one. So I set aside this Amaya Rain. But then suddenly, she came into my life. It's not crazy to do the 24-inch Amaya as your first Rainbow High, right? I mean, the 12-inch doll is cute and all. But come on, look at this beauty. I actually really love the lip and nose mold on this doll. And she's so big and detailed that I can't even get all of her in frame at once. Now the one thing that I am disappointed in is her hair. She may have 14 inches of it, but she's pretty bald. Which is actually kind of sad because it's great hair. Really soft and smooth. It doesn't matter though, because Moraine doesn't have rainbow hair. So, we've got to chop it all off. But, before I started to attack her head with scissors, I decided to put her hair into elastics. That way, I could save these gorgeous locks for another doll. And now that we've decapitated her and rid her of all of her hair, it's time to cut her head open, of course. So, I bring out my trusty respirator and my goggles. And apparently fill my house with smoke. <laughs> it kind of makes you wonder if neurosurgery looks like this too. <laughs> After I had her scalp open, I was able to start removing the hair. You see, I watch all these other customizers easily pull the hair out, but I'm never that lucky. It seems like it's always a struggle and takes forever. Once that was finally done, I was able to use Sandy, my Dremel, to clean up where I'd opened the scalp. One of my biggest complaints about these Rainbow High dolls is their eyes. They kind of lack some depth and definition, so we must remove them. Ah, that's much better. Then I used Sandy to clean up my shoddy cutting abilities. I also made a little bit of extra room for new eyes. Oh yeah, about that. These poor eyes, they didn't deserve it. <sighs> the wheel weaves what the wheel wills, right? 
Well, now that that's done, it's time for some Dolly skincare. I'm using 100% acetone to remove all of her makeup. And let me tell you, there was a lot of paint on here. I mean, I get that it's a big doll, so there's gonna be more paint, but this felt like there was layers and layers and layers of it. Sis needs to cut back on her Sephora bill is all I'm saying. But hey, to each their own. To get into all the little nooks and crannies, I used a Q-tip soaked in acetone. Now we can see how spectacular the lips, nose, and ears are molded. However, I don't care for the eyes, so let's change those a bit. I saw in Dolls and Dabblings video that she used ping pong balls for the eyes. I'm not going to use them for the eyes, but I am going to use it as a base. You see, the ping pong balls will help protect the inside of the head, but I can also use it to help build off of. After my hot glue had dried, it was time to pull out my epoxy sculpt. I like to use a little scale to ensure that I'm getting equal parts of part A and B. Then I mix it together thoroughly. After waiting five minutes to make sure it's not so tacky, I place it onto her head. At this point, I'm just roughly placing it onto her head and using a little bit of water to help it glide. Then after I'm pleased with the placement, I start going in and adding the fine details. The truly fine details will happen in a later phase. Once I'm happy with the basic shape, it's time to let it dry overnight. My first step is to use Sandy to blend out the edges of the epoxy with the vinyl. Even with a Dremel, this part takes forever. Actually, the whole sculpting and sanding part took me over a week with this doll. She just gave me so many problems. But I'm not gonna make you watch all of that because it doesn't make for an entertaining video. <laughs> now that we have our tools at the ready, I begin by using the scalpel and chisels to continue to carve and refine my sculpt. Really, the best advice I can give you is to use any tools at your disposal to get the shape and symmetry that you want. I mean, try not to leave huge gashes in it that'll be hard to get out later, but use what you can. Once you're happy with the way it looks, you can start to sand. I usually start with a rougher grid of sandpaper to get out the big bumps. And I found that using a little bit of water gives it a smoother sanding and also helps protect the sandpaper, so it doesn't wear out as quickly. Then use finer and finer grits to make the face smooth. So, I was a total woolhead when it came to sanding the hole in her scalp. I sanded too much and then it didn't fit anymore. So I had my wife 3D print me a new one. I'll figure out how to attach it later, but right now I secured it with painter's tape. I needed it on there so I could start making the wig cap. First, I protected the rest of her head with cellophane. Then I pulled out this super stretchy t-shirt material, then draped it over her head. Then secured it in place with a rubber band. I made sure to pull it tight along the edges so that there wouldn't be any creases. Then it was time for the glue. Since I was going to be using so much of it, I opted to use this foam brush. It caused some issues, but it worked out in the end. Then I just slathered it on. <laughs> then let it dry for 24 hours. Once the glue had hardened, I sketched out where the hairline was, and then cut along that line. Maureen's hair color is a dark brown, so this white scalp was not going to work. So I used my airbrush to paint the scalp brown. I bought these beautiful wefted locks from Nezabuka dolls on Etsy. It turns out they live in Ukraine and are selling digital files to try to raise money. I'll put their link in the description so if you feel like helping them out, you can. With the wig cap on the doll, I marked her center part and prepped the hair wefts by straightening the sewn edge with a flat iron. For some reason, E6000 just wasn't cutting it this time, so I decided to use contact cement. The way contact cement works is you first apply it to both items you are gluing. In this case, it's the wig cap and the wefts. Then you wait about five minutes, and then they magically create a bond that won't separate. For the center part, I cut along the line that I drew, then glued wefts along the outer edge. 
then glued wefts on the inner edge of both sides and folded them out. And then I hand sewed the two edges back together. As good as she looks with gray on her face, let's change that. First, I gave her a generous coat of Mr. Super Clear Matte. Then I followed it up with this cool airbrush primer I just got. Then I gently sanded it to make it smooth again. Now here's something I've never tried before. I saw a doll customizer play around with subdermal coloring. Now, I can't for the life of me find that video again, but if it's yours, please let me know so I can link it. For the time being, I will link some resources. Essentially, it's that all of our faces are made up of different sublayers of color. Of course, it's most noticeable in light-skinned faces, but it's there in all skin tones. Perhaps I'll make a longer video about it in the future because there's just so much to say about this. The long and the short of it is that our faces are divided into three color zones, yellow, red, and blue. Then our skin pigment is created by the melanin that's in our outer skin layers. So I tried to recreate this by lightly airbrushing over the colors I put on, then sealed it with Mr. Super Clear Matte. And while you can't see it in this video, I think it was actually successful because the skin tone has a more realistic look to it. All right, let's get this doll some facial features, shall we? I began by mixing up a custom color of chalk pastels for her blushing. Then I moved on to the heavy hitters, pan pastels. When you want to get a lot of pigment on your doll all at once, pan pastels is the way to go. But be careful to not dance with the dark one while you're applying them, because it is very easy to overdo it. Ask me how I know. After I'm done with basic contouring, I move on to these beauties. I use my watercolor pencils to start putting in some fine details, like the base color of her waterline or the creases of her eyelids. Look, if you're new to customizing, the most important piece of advice that I can give you is don't cheap out on the colored pencils. If you finish this video and learn nothing but that you need to spend money on watercolor pencils, then my job here is done. I don't currently receive a commission for any of the products I use, but let me tell you, I used to use cheap watercolor pencils. They were still Faber-Castell, but they were student quality. So once I received this artist quality set, I'm not kidding you, my doll making life changed forever. Okay, that might be a little overdramatic, but I tell you what, I'm never going back. Okay, okay, now back to this doll. So I'm still learning how to do bottom eyelashes, and I kind of went overboard on them. So do me a favor and not look too closely at them, okay? As with everything in life, you have to suck at something before you get better. Once I'm happy with the color of the face, I spray her with Mr. Super Clear semi-gloss. Then I follow it up with a couple of layers of Super Clear Matte. This will give her skin a dewy glow. Then I pull out my Liquitex Gloss Varnish and add gloss to her lips, the inside of her nose, and her waterline. Now it was time to add lashes, but these seemed a little too long. So I created a new lash line with tacky glue, let that dry, and then cut them out. Then voila, new shorter lashes. Then I used clear tacky glue to attach them to her eyelids. <laughs> Since I completely obliterated her first ones, let's make her some new eyes. I had my wife design and 3D print these eye bases. Then I pulled out my second favorite art supply. <laughs> Rosamund Pike has gorgeous blue-gray eyes with little flecks of brown in the center. So that's what I'm going to try to recreate. I begin by painting the iris with my Arteza metallic paints then fill the pupil with black UV resin. Once that is cured, I fill the top with clear UV resin. Then I'm left with some really pretty blue-gray eyes. Okay, you guys all know my struggle with sewing. So please explain to me why I decided to do Moraine's white tower dress. Thankfully, Bernadette Banner recently did a series where she recreated the dress for herself. So I was able to take some cues from her. As always, I started by wrapping her body in saran wrap. 
then applying painter's tape on top of the plastic wrap. Then applied a thin washi tape along where the seam lines were going to be. When the washi tape failed me, I moved on to Silver Sharpie. <laughs> then cut the pieces off of her body along the seam lines. I made sure to mark my pieces so I would know how to put it back together again. And here's my beginning pattern pieces. Many of these pieces still need to be modified though. In order to make those modifications, I taped the pieces onto scratch paper. Then traced around the pieces while cleaning up the shapes as I went. The front of the bodice has this strange, long, floor-length, flappy part. Since this doll is so tall, I actually had to paste two pieces of paper together to get this part. Then drew and traced the addition to my bodice front. Now Moraine's sleeves have a triangle detail at the shoulder and belled cuffs at the wrist. Luckily, Ms. Banner figured out that this must have been a three-part sleeve pattern. Otherwise, I probably would have been tearing my hair out in frustration. So, these are a three-part sleeve going down and an additional part to make the triangle shoulder. I will forever be grateful that she showed her pattern pieces in her video. I mean, I probably would have figured something out, but this was so much easier. Now that we have a pattern, I guess we need to shop for fabric. The problem is, is that this dress changes color from scene to scene. So I started my hunt at the fabric store. And I kind of felt like Goldilocks. This one's too dark, this one's too purple. It was kind of hard to pick. Then I found this really pretty brushed crepe fabric. The right side had like this kind of rubbery texture to it but the wrong side was perfect. Then there was nothing left to do but cut out my pattern pieces. The long front part of the bodice is intended to be cut out on a fold. That way you don't have a seam running down the center of the dress. The rest of the pieces can be cut out from the center of the fabric. Yay, I got to use my disappearing ink again. And as always, make sure you remember to fray check your edges. Make sure you keep track of your sleeve pieces because they can easily become very confusing. I mean, I sewed the wrong pieces together several times. <laughs> and now for an epic location change. When I cut out the front bodice piece, I also cut a shorter lining piece of the same fabric. I did this so I didn't have to double the bulk of the bodice part, but keep the flappy part looking clean. So I hemmed the part that would be on the inside of the dress. Then took the full bodice piece and sewed it to the lining piece on three sides, right sides together. When it comes to making doll clothes, I like to make my stitch length a little bit smaller. It makes me feel like it's a little bit more in scale. Then I turn those pieces right side out. Then I attach the front side piece to the bodice front. This creates a nice dart line on the front of the dress. Then I sew the back pieces to the back side pieces. Then sew both parts together at the shoulder. I'm not sponsored by Alyssa, I just love my cute little pink iron. <laughs> Okay, now it's starting to look like a bodice. So I goofed a little bit when I was patterning the collar. It obviously needs to open the back so I can get it on her body. So I cut that piece in half. Then sewed those new pieces together on three sides, turned it right side out, and top stitched so it would lay flat. Then attached it to the neck of the bodice, and top stitched along the bottom so that the collar would stand up. And now for those dreaded sleeves. With the outer fabric, I stitched the shoulder triangle to the back sleeve at the top. 
then attach the center piece and the front piece together. I guess that kind of looks like a sleeve. Now to do the exact same thing, but with the lining pieces. Triangle the back piece. Center piece, and then front. Then I pressed all my seams open. Looking pretty good. Next, I pin my lining and my outer fabric together. And sew along the wrist section. Then turn the sleeve right side out. Then top stitch to make it lay flat. Bernadette also suggested that the sleeve should be basted in order to hold the pieces in place. Basting is where you sew the pieces with a really long stitch length so they can be easily removed later. I basted down the center of each section of the sleeve and then sewed the cap to the bodice. You can kind of see that triangle sleeve. With the basting stitches still in place, I sewed the length of the sleeve. Then carefully removed the basting stitches. Okay, now for the part that I've been dreading, these hip rolls or whatever you call them. Since I have the main part of the bodice put together, I'm able to trace the hip shape from that to start my pattern. Then cleaned up that tracing and cut it out so I could better visualize what the shape's supposed to look like. And then kind of just freehand the rest of it because I wasn't sure how it was supposed to be shaped. Have you noticed a theme with me and my doll making? <laughs> I'm always kind of just making things up as I go. <laughs> I started by sewing the outer edge of the roll, then turned it right side out and then sewed three quarters of the way up the inner side. This gave me a cute little pocket to stuff polyfill into. The trick is to stuff it tight, but to not overfill it so the roll could lay smoothly over her hip. Then I just stitched over the top to close it, then sewed it into the bodice trying to keep my previous stitch lines hidden in the new seam. Finally, I tucked the front point of the hip roll into the front dress flap and top stitched to tack that down and allow the flap to lay cleanly. Bernadette Banner mentioned that she used a three panel skirt pattern. That seemed like a good idea, so I went with it. I began by taking her waist measurement and then multiplying that number by three. Then I divided that number by four. That measurement will be my panel width measurement. One panel will be double the width to allow for her train. I added two inches to the bottom of the wide panel to include the train, then an inch on top of each of the pieces for the waistband and hem, then measured and cut those pieces with the long grain of the fabric. The rough, stitched side of the fabric is called the selvage. The fabric's long grain often runs the same direction as it. Just a dolly pup mic drop tidbit for you. <laughs> so I pieced the panels on the lawn sides, so I now have a lawn flat panel of fabric. Then I discovered my machine actually has a basting stitch. <laughs> so I basted two lines along the top and pulled the back threads to gather the fabric. However, after making it with the same fabric as the bodice, I decided that looked too bulky. So I went with a more sheer fabric. Next, I needed to design the waistband. Essentially, I created bias tape where I cut a rectangle 10 inches wide and four inches tall. Then I folded that in half and ironed, then folded the outer edges to the center fold and then ironed, then sandwiched my gathered edge in between and top stitched along the bottom edge. Next, I used my sewing gauge to measure and mark where my hem should be. Then I hemmed along the bottom, created an opening notch to help the skirt get over the hips, and then sewed up the remaining side. I did try to recreate the tie I look for her skirt, but it inevitably looked muddy, so I opted to omit that. I chose to use snaps for the bodice because it would hold the back neatly closed and be a bit stronger than Velcro. However, for closing the neck, I wanted something a little prettier. Thankfully, I had just received these pretty buckles from AliExpress. Doesn't it make such a nice addition? I liked it so much, I decided to use the same buckles for the skirt. And it was about this part in the project when I realized I hate myself. I mean, it's just a bolero, right? Ah! 
Thankfully, a costumer named Hazariel Costumes recently shared the pattern she made. So I easily scaled it down to my doll's size. Actual leather would be too thick for this size of bolero. And really, I have no clue how to work with leather. So I chose to use high density EVA foam. I simply traced the pattern pieces and cut it out with X-Acto blades. I've been watching Kamui Cosplay's videos and she almost exclusively works with EVA foam, which inspired me to give it a try. Wow, most of this video has been me name dropping other YouTubers. Do I have an addiction to YouTube? Yikes. Nah, <laughs> I'm good. I'm doing just fine, right? Right? After I finished cutting the pieces, I sanded the edges to clean them up. Hazariel Costumes was also gracious enough to mark where the decorations should be placed. So I used a bone folder to trace those lines and mark the foam. Then I went over them again with a pencil. The bolero is embossed with this sunburst sort of pattern. I don't have a die for that, so I used the end of a round sculpting tool to create the same effect. At this size, they look very similar. Next, I need to figure out how to recreate the round circle pattern. One of my screwdriver sets had these small, interchangeable bits. And lucky for me, there was an octagon-shaped bit that made an imprint that was the perfect size. Funny enough, there was also a triangle bit that worked perfectly if you pressed hard enough. That gave those triangles an almost punched-out look. As suggested by Kamui Cosplay, I attached the foam pieces together with contact cement. Remember to put contact cement on each edge you are gluing together. This will ensure a tight bond. I started by gluing the body pieces together first and then the arm pieces separately. When both sections were done, I glued them together. That was the easy part. Now for all the hand-sewn details. <laughs> I used a thick cotton thread to add the border whip stitch around the bolero perimeter. For the raised stitched piping, I used a thicker wax-coated thread and tacked it in place with tacky glue. Then I sewed them in place with a regular width thread in a different color because I learned my lesson with the white thread. <laughs> I did this by first poking holes with my needle along the piping path and then pulling the thread up and over the yellow cording and back into the same hole. But I have to tell you, this was very time consuming. The shortest pieces took me 45 minutes to finish with the longer pieces taking me an hour and a half. This time-lapse video couldn't even continue for the entire time because it hit the camera's maximum length for time-lapse footage. Just this part of the bolero took me approximately 30 hours to complete. And just when I thought I was done, I realized I still had the shoulder pads. <sighs> it's okay, I finally finished them. Then I coated them with Mr. Super Clear and Primer. Once it had dried, I mixed together some blue paint. Then airbrushed the pieces. And finished off the painting with a few coats of Mr. Super Clear. Now, obviously Moraine loves some bling because her bolero is decked out in these pearl looking studs. So I found these flat back nail art pearls in various sizes on Amazon. However, they arrived like this. Oh, God! Ah! All of the sizes were packed into one bag, and there was so much static electricity that you could barely pull them apart. But hey, I got this cool wax pencil. So I decided to pivot to rhinestones instead, and all the same size. Ooh, sparkly. So I proceeded to place them in the octagon imprints I had made earlier with a little dab of crazy glue. By the way, I am so glad that I got that wax pencil. It was totally the MVP for this project. 
Next, I needed to attach the shoulder pads. I began by applying heat with my heat gun and bending it over an aerosol can to shape it, then carefully gluing it on with contact cement. However, I felt like the rhinestones were too shiny, so I coated the entire bolero again with a coat of Mr. Super Clear Matte. Now I think it looks perfect. Marine doesn't seem like the rainbow panties type of person, so those needed to go. I used sandpaper because acetone seemed to be melting the plastic. As beautiful and as detailed as this doll is, the seam lines on her were atrocious. I decided to level them as best as I could with sanding blocks. It was time consuming, but so worth it. Then I buffed out the scratches with finer grits of sandpaper. Then, unfortunately, I noticed how good the sanded body pieces looked. So, of course, I had to do the whole body. Unfortunately, there was some paint left over in the seams that I just couldn't get out. Finally, I cleaned her body with a little bit of water and Dawn dish soap, tied a piece of yarn around her neck joint, and sprayed her with Mr. Super Clear Matte outside because she couldn't fit in my spray box. When that had dried, I began blushing her body with pan pastels. I'm still kind of learning how to do this. Mostly, I try to add shadows where light wouldn't hit and highlights in places that I'd like it to look a little more supple. Oddly enough, I think my favorite places to blush are the feet and hands. Just adding those little details makes such a huge difference in the way the body looks. And don't forget to seal it in with Mr. Super Clear. Well, if we don't want her losing her head, we should probably secure it. First, I mixed up some of the old epoxy sculpt. Then I marked my three connection spots and transferred those spots over to the scalp. Then I attached some super strong neodymium magnets to the scalp with epoxy sculpt. It works great. Moraine has this weird gold ear clamp on her ear. I tried a few different things, but I think gold leaf was gonna work best. So I painted on a little bit of PVA glue, then laid the sheet on top and tamped it down with a soft brush, then let it dry and gently brushed it away. Ah, yes, her hairpin. Believe it or not, there are no really good shots of this piece so we kind of had to make it up based on what we could find. My wife designed and 3D printed it, and then I airbrushed black paint and then followed it with this awesome color shifting paint. Now it looks like abalone. Next on the docket is Moraine's headdress. I couldn't find any jewelry pieces that perfectly matched it, but I did find these nail art jewels. However, I wanted it to be a little bigger, so I glued it to this jewelry connector piece. Finally, I attached it to this gold chain. Ooh, it's so pretty. Of course, the most important accessory is Moraine's great serpent ring. I wish the amount of detail my wife put into this ring came across on video. It is so cool. So we 3D printed it, painted it gold, applied a gloss varnish, and then glued in a small plastic gem. Gah, I wish you could see the snake eating his own tail on this thing. It's amazing. My wife took over the boot making portion of this project because I was already two weeks behind schedule. So I'm going to do my best to narrate what she did. First, she 3D printed some soles to use as a base. Then she used painter's tape to make an inner sole template. Then she used the template to create a boot pattern based on a design we found online. After cutting out the pattern, she cut the inner sole out of warbler. Then she heated the warbler to mold it into the same shape as her outer sole. We've never used warbler before, but I'm pretty impressed with the stuff. I'll have to try out some other things with it in the future. Then she traced and cut the remaining pattern pieces out of black faux leather. Then she decided to try her hand at one of my infamous pieces reveal shots. <laughs> Get ready for another YouTuber name drop. 
I had been showing my wife some of Moonlight Jewel's videos and how obsessed she is with Uhu Glue. So my wife absolutely needed to try it for herself. <laughs> so after I sewed the back of the boot for her, she folded and glued the seams flat. Then she glued the heel reinforcement piece in place and turned the pieces right side out. Next, she hand sewed the vamp of the boot to the throat. then snipped around the edges so the fabric could bend easily around the inner sole. Next, with our new favorite adhesive, contact cement, she glued the fabric to the sole, then attached the entire boot to the outer sole. I think she did a great job. As with all of my doll creations, I try to add a small bit of artwork and my signature to the back of the doll's head. The symbol of the Aes Sedai looks a lot like the yin and yang graphic. The white represents the flame of Tarvalin, and the black represents the dragon's fane. The two parts together are needed to push the wheel of time. Because of this, I thought this was the perfect symbol for her head. With my watercolor pencils, I lightly drew the symbol, her name, the year of her creation, her position in my series of dolls, and my signature. Then filled in the shapes with some thinned acrylic paint and finalized it with Mr. Super Clear Matte. First, I needed to put her head back onto her neck. So I heated the base of her head with a heat gun until it was pliable and sort of jammed it on until it fit. <laughs> because of the weight of this wig, I didn't trust it to stay on her head. So I pulled out some Velcro and glued some to the top of her head and to the inside of the wig. This created a strong but not permanent adhesion for the wig. Whenever I can help it, I try to not make anything permanent with my dolls. If their new owner wants to change their eyes, wig, or clothes, they can easily do so. That's just sort of my own personal philosophy. <laughs> okay, so after placing the wig on her head and protecting her face with tin foil, I attempted to style finger waves into her hair. So I clipped the hair where I wanted the bends in the waves and heated the hair with a heat gun. And this was mildly successful. Then I braided her hair and then sewed the braids into a bun. I felt so bad because her hair was so long and luscious, but it was way too much for the character, which meant I had to chop it off. First, I shortened the length with my shears and I took out a lot of bulk with my thinning shears. I had a follower once tell me that the best way to use thinning shears was to twist the hair before cutting on the lower layers. I'm not a hairstylist, so I just trust them and went with it. <laughs> Next, I used an eyebrow razor to thin the ends. Lastly, I wetted the hair and placed it in braids to help restore the natural wave. And here is the sad aftermath. <laughs> it's almost as if I cut a grown human's hair. There's so much of it. The first step was to secure her eyes with museum putty. Then I reused the socks she came with. Then I struggled to pull her skirt past her juicy hips. <laughs> Once I succeeded, I secured it in the front. Then placed her inside her bodice and secured the snaps in the back. Then carefully pulled the bolero up onto her shoulders. And placed her wig, her boots, her hairpin, her headdress, and most importantly, her ring. Okay, now for the moment I know you all have been waiting for. Here is Moraine's before, and here is her after. Enjoy.
while this doll and video took me two months to finish, I have to say that I learned a lot about my art. It was exhausting, but I think she's deserving of the Moraine name. If you're new here and you liked this project, please subscribe. You'll get notified when I upload new videos, plus every subscription, like, share, and comment helps my channel grow. Plus, my favorite part of the video making process is chatting with you all afterward. Every time I get a notification, my heart skips a beat. Thank you for watching, and may you always find water and shade.